We've just done the Premier League, now the Football League here on BBC One, and the goals keep coming. Good evening. If you've had enough of Bloodgate, Crashgate or Stampgate, the only thing they're talking about in the Football League is the football. We've got a staggering 109 goals to get in tonight. And helping me to get through the lot of them, Beauty and the Beast. I'll let you decide who's who between Steve Carriage and Robbie Savage. And as always, Lizzie's here waiting to hear from you. Lizzie. Thanks for not mentioning me amongst the beasts there, Manish. Yes, after another cracking day's Football League action, what would you like to share with the nation? We want to know what you've got to say about all of today's action. You can text us on 81111 or send us an email to footballleague at bbc.co.uk. And don't forget, you've got two for the price of one today. You've got Robbie and Steve to get your questions to. And also, thanks for everyone who answered my question last week. Why is Im Parland called Charlie? Well, it's because apparently he walks like Charlie Chaplin. Thanks, Lizzie. Here's how we line up tonight. After the agony of relegation, both Middlesbrough and West Brom have hit the ground running in the championship. But who came out on top as the two squared up on Teesside? I'm Mark Clement, and as the third relegated team, Newcastle look to bounce back after their first defeat of the campaign. Bottom of the table, Plymouth, were the visitors to St James's Park, with these guys making the Football League's longest trip of the season. <laughs> And in League Two, Sol Campbell was finally fit enough to play his first competitive game since he lined up for Portsmouth in May. Well, there's only one place to start in the Championship as the top two met at the Riverside. Borough, with just one defeat, took on an unbeaten West Brom side. Commentary comes from Tony Gubber. Middlesbrough and West Brom were both relegated from the Premier League last season but they're the top two in the championship after seven games, separated by just one point, and this is the division's game of the day. Well, Middlesbrough give a full debut today to central defender Sean St. Ledger on three months' loan from Preston, but Caleb Folan, also on loan from Hull, is a substitute after training with the team for two days. Adam Johnson is the top scorer with six in eight appearances. West Brom are without the injured Marek Cech, they include striker Luke Moore, there's a start for Jerome Thomas, and Chris Brunt is asked to play on the right side of midfield. Middlesbrough haven't been beaten at home in three league games so far this season. West Brom haven't been beaten home or away in seven, plus two League Cup ties, two impressive records that are under threat this afternoon. Albion kick off attacking the goal to the left and straight away surrender possession. Head down the line by Yates. Shouts from the Albion supporters and it might have crossed the line. Good work here by McMahon. Things opening up for McMahon. He went for a strike, I'm sure of that. Matok. Thomas has really had no space in which to operate yet. Here's the fullback. Takes it off McMahon. And there's another free kick. McMahon disputes the decision. Well, the referee clearly thought that he was holding back Joe Mattock. There was a slight drag on the arm. Middlesbrough finishing in 19th place in the Premier League last season. A lot of pushing and shoving going on. Oh, that came off the head of a defender onto the roof of the net, and it was Arca. Apologetic shrug of the shoulders. Might have beaten Danny Coyne, just dropping over the crossbar. I just want to get the ball upfield, get it clear. Ali Adier tries to flick it on, it drops in midfield and 
The crowd shouted a warning, but it wasn't heard. Oh, and that's a silly challenge. A silly, silly challenge. Rhys Williams clearly angered that he didn't get a decision in his own favour earlier. But that was a stupid reaction just outside his own penalty area. Doesn't look as if the wall's the full distance, but uh, Trevor Kettle, the referee, seems happy enough with it. It is Chris Brunt who takes it. Oh, and it's gone in! Chris Brunt opens the scoring for West Brom against his former club. Roberto Di Matteo's unbeaten West Brom lead at Middlesbrough by one goal to nil. There was a deflection. Came off the, the backside of Julio Arca by the looks of it. But there was a big hole in the wall when it was struck. It's Middlesbrough nil. It's West Brom one. Here's Ali Adier. With a decent cross, Ems couldn't get a strong header in, shouts for handball, ignored. Well, it looked more the upper shoulder. Well, Southgate looking concerned. And trailing by one goal to nil and picking up a couple of portions. The flag stayed down. Graham Doran started his run from midfield and it's in. Oh, that is unbelievable. Chris Brunt rubs salt into the wounds. Di Matteo will a half smile perhaps. But it was just a long punt forward and Danny Coyne sprinted out of his penalty area to hoof it clear. He got there ahead of Dorans, but it went straight to Chris Brunt, and that is really clever. Left footer, what a clever return that is. Yates to Arca, gives it in back. Yates is dispossessed. That's aimed at Luke Moore, took it on his thigh. Inside to Malumbu. Malumba with the header! 3-0! Well, this time, Matteo comes off the bench and his face breaks into a great big smile. Malumba, who broke forward from midfield, he fed it out wide to Graham Dorans, who chipped it back in, and a looping header finds the top corner. It's an emphatic scoreline for the team who sit on top of the championship. What instructions will he have given his team at half-time? Oh! Well, that looked as if it was down for the top corner, but very confidently clipped out of the air by Scott Carson. Here's Dorans. Bednar. Got the shot away, and it's Bednar, and it is four. And Middlesbrough's defence was static. Bednar, who picked it up on the edge of the area, whipped in the right foot shot, and it was past Danny Coyne in a flash. Just dropping to Bedner on the edge of the area. And that's his third goal of the season. It's Albion's fourth of the afternoon. And it's three points. Here's Cloud falling. Well, Yates with the shot, which has at least uh, forced a save from Scott Carson. He's pushed it behind for a corner. It might have been going wide anyway. Scotland manager George Burley among the crowd watching at the Riverside this afternoon. Driven in solidly by 
Leroy Lita. Obviously, Scott Carson to make a save. One of their better efforts. Diggard's pass has been picked off by Chris Wood. Here's Thomas. Still Jermaine Thomas, how long does he want? It's five! He took as long as he needed. West Brom are serious contenders for automatic promotion. It's another blow to the heart of Middlesbrough. Players push forward for the set piece, caught out by the quick break. It looked as if Thomas had taken too long over this, but he was just making sure. Driven in left footed. Well, that's the first goal that he has scored for West Brom. It's his sixth appearance today, and it gives us a scoreline of Middlesbrough nil, West Brom five. And cause for concern and serious thought for Gareth Southgate, whose team have in truth been humbled. Pretty much everything that could have gone wrong did, and um, uh, you know we've, we've had a, a severe pasting which hurts, but um, how we respond to it is the most important thing now. You know, we've had plenty of pats on the back for how we've started the season. Um, we're still sat in third place. Um, West Brom have played very well today. Yeah, I thought we were strong everywhere, at the back, midfield, up front. We always looked dangerous, never, we were never really under pressure, so uh, it was a great performance. At the end of the day, we really came here and taken a 1-0, but 5-0 obviously it looks pretty convincing and, and the way we played was, was really good. So hopefully it sends out a message to, to the rest of the league and hopefully we can follow it up with uh, a win next week at, at home to Crystal Palace. Painful viewing there for Borough fans, but what about West Brom, Robbie? I mean, that was unbelievable. Everything they did went their way, didn't it? Yeah, the first two goals, you know, they haven't had to work hard for a set piece. Um, but the second goal from Chris Brunt is um, this technique there to, to get the ball over over the keeper is, is a fantastic goal. And for me, West Brom are the favourites to go. He kept his composure here, Chris Brunt, didn't he? Yes, it's, it, the ball's just bounced in front. It's a half volley, and he's he's controlled it well. And that's that's that's, that's great technique from Chris Brunt. That is, if if you're in the game, you know how difficult that skill mm. is to execute. That is a fantastic strike and a great execution, a really, as Robbie says, great technique. So what about Borough then, Steve? I mean, five yep. wins out of six before today. Yep. Can a result like that today undo all their good work? Well, I mean, already Gareth's saying we've got to move on, and if you put that one behind you, psychologically that'll have a massive effect, there's no doubt about that, and you do get the feeling, probably for the first time, you question whether or not have they sold one too many players, because on that evidence, you know, certainly defensively, you know, they were a little bit short at times. Yeah, uh, you were watching that game on final score yeah. this afternoon. Uh, Jerome Thomas got, caught your eye, didn't oh, he? did he? I mean, after watching him at Portsmouth, where you know, to say he's peripheral would be, would be probably doing him, you know, di uh, would be probably saying too much. He was fantastic today. Everything about him was positive. Every time he picked the ball up, you know, it, it was one thing in his mind that was to get at the opposition, get around the back of the opposition, which is more important. You know, and every time he did it, he put people on the back foot. You can see it goes drifts past people. And what he's doing is he's pulling that ball back, and defenders are facing their own goal, and that's where they don't want to defend. And his, his goal was the icing on the cake, I and mean, he's turned the player inside out time and time again, and it's a super finish. And he was the exact opposite of what the player we saw, I saw, at Portsmouth. You can tell he's been brought up at Arsenal, can't you? Uh, well, below Borough and West Brom and Newcastle, we'll see them a little later, but there's a clutch of teams looking to keep up the pace on the top three. We'll start our round-up with one of them, Cardiff, at home to Queen's Park Rangers. Your commentator, John Roder. Flavio Briatore has more time to concentrate on QPR after his resignation from Formula One team Renault. Briatore wasn't at this match, where the visitors took the lead with a hotly disputed goal. Cardiff thought Jay Simpson was offside, as he calmly claimed his first for Rangers since joining on loan from Arsenal. QPR winger Wayne Routledge endured a torrid time from Cardiff's fans after turning down a permanent move to the Bluebirds over the summer. He responded by creating a second goal for Simpson. In the second half, Rowan Vine wasted the chance to make the scoreline look more emphatic. 
A much-needed victory for Jim Magilton. QPR now have back-to-back -back wins on the road and a good end to a bad week for Briatore. I haven't managed to get hold of him, though, or, you know, I know he's been otherwise uh, and, you know, involved in other things. So, you know, this, is, this result is as much for him as it is for everybody at the club. After going down to their first league defeat of the season at Scunthorpe, Preston manager Alan Irvin made four changes to his side as they welcomed Coventry. Irvin blamed a slow start for their defeat in midweek, and it felt like deja vu for Preston fans as they fell behind after 19 minutes. Sammy Klingon won't score too many better than that, quite a way to open his account for the Sky Blues. Preston are one of only three teams in the division to have scored in every match this season. And they continued that run after the recalled Chris Brown was given time and space following a superb cross from Chris Sedgwick. Brown's strike partner Neil Mellor was also recalled after being left out in midweek. The former Liverpool striker started and finished the move that saw Preston take command of the game. Preston were running away with it. And they went 3-1 up when Chris Brown grabbed his second of the afternoon, his sixth of the season, after Kieran Westwood failed to hold Richard Chaplow's corner. For Coventry, there was a late consolation. Darren Carter inadvertently headed the ball into Clinton Morrison's path. But it proved to be the final action of the match. Irvin's side returning to winning ways with their fifth consecutive victory at Deepdale. Heider Helgerson returned for his second spell at Vicarage Road, hoping to help Watford continue their fine start to the season. Visitors Leicester have already proved they won't be pushovers on their return to the championship. And it was the Foxes who were given the chance to open the scoring on 20 minutes. For some reason only known to himself, John Eustace handled Robbie Nielsen's cross. And that left Matt Fryatt to score his third goal in four games. Fryatt was the Foxes' leading scorer last season with 32 goals, and the striker has simply continued where he left off in May. This goal is eighth of the season. Leicester well on course for their first away win of the campaign. But Watford weren't prepared to give up their unbeaten home record this season without a fight. Danny Graham showing terrific strength to hold off Robbie Nielsen to get his side back into the game just after half-time. The introduction of Heider Helgerson as a substitute galvanised the home side, and they soon had their second goal in as many minutes. Helgerson was idolised during his first spell for the club. He wasted no time in getting reacquainted with the home fans. Helgerson had struggled with form and fitness during his time at QPR but was wasting no time on his return to Vicarage Road. A remarkable comeback from the Hornets. Helgerson's second of the match. Watford now 3-2 ahead and surely heading for victory. That was until deep into injury time, when Danny and Gesson foiled a third straight win for the Hornets with a powerful header. A point apiece, and both managers unhappy they didn't win it. Gary Johnson had plenty of selection problems ahead of the visit of Inform Scunthorpe because of a virus that had swept through his squad. City looking to continue their 100% record at Ashton Gate this season. But it was Scunthorpe who started the brighter in an opening half of few chances. Jonathan Forte's goal was disallowed after a very tight offside call. Fans of slapstick comedy will appreciate Bristol City's opener. Look out for the clearance which goes straight to Rickan Saborio for his first goal since joining on loan from Swiss side Sion. That was the first City goal not to be scored by Nicky Maynard at Ashton Gate this season. An injury to Gary Hooper after Scunthorpe had used all their substitutes saw the iron finish with ten men, but their resolve was rewarded deep into injury time. Grant McCann grabbing a late equaliser to end a very enjoyable week for Nigel Adkins. We worked very hard. We've come away from home to play an excellent football inside and uh, we certainly didn't de deserve to lose the game. I think the point was an excellent one for ourselves and uh, it gives us more resolve. It's, it's been an excellent week for us. Yeah, it's been an amazing turnaround for Scunthorpe, hasn't it? Three league defeats and then suddenly a great week for them, Robbie. You played them, didn't you, for Derby? Yeah, seven points in a week from some great wins. Um, we went up there with Derby, got beat 3-2. 
on that day, the front two, in, I think Gary Hooper and Paul Hayes were magnificent. Um, yeah. I think them two for all season, they'll have a good season. They play football. You know, it's a tight little stadium up there, so they've done, they've done fantastic. But seven points in a week for me is incredible. I think what you said there was key as well, because they've got such a small squad and how valuable players like that. They've got to keep fit throughout the season. What about the game at Vicarage Road? That was some, some spectacle. Malky Mackay is doing a good job at Watford. He is doing a good job under very difficult circumstances. Mm. Sold, for me, his best player in Tommy Smith. You know, we all know they've had to cut their cloth accordingly. Um, and, you know, when you think about the team he took over, which, you know, in effect was struggling last year for the majority of that season he's done he's done a super job and uh, it's nice that he's got it because he had it temporarily you know and, and had it taken away probably thinking i've been done a little bit hard done by here but eventually he's been given it and they, you know their, their faith has been rewarded so good luck to him okay dare i say west brom fans will be emailing and texting in their droves uh, lizzie what are they saying well, they're pretty happy, Manish. We've got lots of very happy baggy fans, including Tim, who says Roberto's Italian job is on course. On course, Boing, boing. But the Borough anti-Southgate bandwagon is gathering momentum. Quite a few calling for his head now, including Ashley, who says he should have been sacked after they were relegated. But Liam says the game was appalling. However, it was just one game. We need to give Southgate a go at getting us up again. Keep the faith and stick with him, he says. Now, Rosie, he's a Leicester fan. She was at the game today. She says it was really exciting, but we should have won. One. Nigel Pearson, though, has done a great job, and she says that he's only lost five games out of 53. Pretty good start there. Dan, who is a Scunthorpe fan, he says, no, he's a City fan, he says, even though we drew against Scunthorpe today, that's Bristol City, he says, I'm happy the with the result. Gary Johnson has the intelligence of the game to move us to the Premiership this season. And finally, a message for you, Manish. Mick says, can you please acknowledge that the start Preston have made this season, fourth in the league and only one defeat? And then just a quick question as well for Robbie and Steve from Dylan. He says, who do they think will go up this season? Yeah, I'll acknowledge Preston's form. One defeat in 19 at home. I mean, that's sensational from them. Uh, so, come on then, going up, uh, who, who are you going for? Um, at the minute, you've got to say West Brom, a big, strong team, and Newcastle with the quality of their squad. You know, in this league, the squad, and yeah. Newcastle got the best squad. Steve? I'll go, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with Robbie there at this stage. I don't know whether Newcastle have still got the potential to implode, but I'll also chuck Sheffield United in. OK, the results are still settling down, of course, aren't yeah. they? Early days, yeah. Well, now to Plymouth's trip to Newcastle at 800 miles and 16 hours. It's the longest trek in the Football League. In fact, it's so long, it's even made the club famous thanks to a TV commercial featuring Paul Whitehouse. It cost a fortune support from Plymouth or Goyle. Newcastle away today. I mean, that's a long old poke, isn't it? Right, big Dave, get on. 22 away games last season. Money I spent on petrol. We could have bought Dip Moravan Nostril Boy. Green Orvay! I can't believe our Gal fans wouldn't be up for a trip to Newcastle. Green Army! Oh, must be losing my touch. So just tell me about your day so far. Well, we started this morning at half past two, got to the car park at 20 past three, got on the coach and we left at four o'clock this morning. But the best thing about the away Argyle supporters are that when you get to the ground and everybody is congregated together, the atmosphere that is created and the chanting never stops from the beginning to the end. And that's why we're Argyle away supporters. <laughs> It's a big commitment today to come all this way when you've lost the last five games. Well, it's dedication for you, isn't it? Still got to go and support them. Come what may. It's better than staying at home, doing the washing, the ironing, all the boring things women do. The men have fun, why can't we? Here comes the football anorak bit. Just over 12,000 miles Plymouth fans travel every season to see their team. The equivalent of going nearly halfway around the world. I tell you what, now we're getting near Newcastle. Shall we try again? Green Army! Paul, I've got to talk to you about the extraordinary dedication of your supporters. The trip they've come on today is quite unbelievable. It's incredible. You know, the, you know, the two two thousand plus. You know, spending all that money. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. The, 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 they're here. I remember three years ago when the Sheffield Wednesday and two thousand of them on a Tuesday night being there. The, the fans away from home have been fantastic. Are you starting to feel the pressure? Five straight defeats. Oh, it's not nice. 
I'm saying uh, well, there's light at the end of the tunnel. We, you know, every game we've been competitive. You know, opportunities we've missed that would have changed the complexion of the games. We, we're a different team from last year, and we just need more time to sell. Well, it's been a huge slap for those Argyle fans to get here. Can their team reward them with a first win of the season? Newcastle had yet to drop a point or concede a goal going into this match at home this season. If any of the travelling Green Army arrived late, they would have missed an early goal for the Magpies. Stephen Taylor with the header. It's a trip that Argyle fans haven't had to make very often. This was the first meeting between these two teams in 18 years. But they were given something to cheer after the break. Carl Duguid with the equaliser. Argyle had Newcastle on the back foot for a while after that. But when you're on a bad run, things tend not to go your way. And it was the home team who took the lead, thanks to Kevin Nolan. The game was still finely poised. Plymouth's goal scorer Duguid had a great chance to equalise. But he couldn't take it, and the away team were made to pay. Andy Carroll became a father during the week. He capped a memorable few days with a goal, Newcastle's third, condemning Plymouth to a sixth successive defeat, their worst run in 42 years. You know, the travelling support has been absolutely backed them to the hilt. And to be fair, you know, in the end of the day, I think they'll be walking away disappointed with the result. But I think they can say to, to themselves that the, the, the players get everything they had. Yeah, not too bad. Back on the coach now, ready for the long one back. How was that? Oh, Pardon? shocking for most of it, really. Can't, can't defend to save our lives, can't attack to save our lives. It gets three new defenders in, still letting three goes. Um, you know, it's just time to change now, I think. Well, off they go. The Argyle faithful have just watched their team lose their sixth consecutive game. They've got a 410 mile and eight hour motorway journey ahead of them. I didn't have the heart to say it, I only live half an hour down the road. Now, here on Good Authority, almost 2,000 Plymouth fans made that trip. Good to them, uh, good on them on these uh, tough times for the club. Now, after excelling for a club like Manchester United, Roy Keane knows all about the pressures within the game. But without a win this season, the Ipswich manager, he really needed a result at Doncaster, unbeaten at home so far. Is the pressure starting to mount on Roy Keane? Promotion favourites at the start of the season, Ipswich have made their worst start to a league campaign in 40 years. Keane's inability to name a settled back four once again contributed to Town's downfall early on. Neither Richard Wright or Damien Delaney could make a clearance, gifting Wade Fairhurst the easiest of finishes. Ipswich had yet to win even a point on their travels this season, but they were level through second-half substitute Jack Colbeck, his first senior goal after arriving on loan from Sunderland. If Ipswich fans thought that was to be the turning point for their season, they were wrong. A clever corner from John Oster, setting up Martin Woods a long way out, but he somehow slid the ball through a crowded penalty area. Donny did the double over Ipswich last season, but they were pegged back once again when Thomas Priskin headed in Grant Ledbetter's free kick. And with 11 minutes remaining, Ipswich took the lead for the first time in the match. Former Manchester United trainee Lee Martin pouncing on the loose ball after Tommy Smith had hit the bar. Ipswich's joy wasn't to last, for one of Keane's former Manchester United teammates would ultimately ruin his afternoon. Quinton Fortune arrived from Bolton in the summer and he rolled back the years with an exceptional strike that continued Doncaster's unbeaten home record. The first away point for Ipswich Keane turned around Sunderland from a similar situation. He'll have to do the same again this season. After victory at Derby in midweek, the Barnsley dressing room would have been buzzing ahead of this match. A shame our cameras went in before the players. There was some early drama when Ian Hume went down after a challenge from Ashley Williams. But the Canadian forward, who suffered a horrific head injury last year, was thankfully able to continue for a Barnsley team who had lost their previous three home matches. Hume not impressed by the challenge and making his feelings very obvious. 
The Swans had the better of the possession and the best chance of the match. But neither Nathan Dyer or Cedric van der Gun could get the better of Tykes keeper David Priest. Swansea have scored only three goals in eight championship matches. A first home point for Mark Robbins. This was a match Peterborough manager Darren Ferguson said his team simply had to win. It was a sentiment Royals boss Brendan Rodgers surely felt applied to his side as well. For Reading had failed to score in five of their seven championship matches, but they were on target in this one. What a strike that was from Gilfie Sigurdsson, his first for the club. Icelandic midfielder Sigurdsson is proving something of a free-kick specialist, and he can set goals up too. Simon Church unmarked, Reading two up before half-time. Peterborough, without a win in the championship, might have been expected to fold, but they were given hope just after the break by Craig McHale-Smith. Posh fans had seen their team draw their previous three games, and they were level here just six minutes later. George Boyd setting up McLean for his fourth in the championship this season. The home team had to wait until stoppage time for a winner, and what a goal it was from George Boyd. Simple, yet effective. Ferguson getting exactly what he demanded. First half is nowhere near good enough, and the guy wanted a reaction, and it just shows the character of the team, of how, uh, how far we've come. It was a great, great second half performance. Been the tail of the season, really, so far, you know, even though it's only early. We've been able to do it for periods of the game, but you've got to sustain it. It's a 90-minute game and uh, sometimes longer than that, and we'll, we'll need to learn very quickly. Nottingham Forest welcomed Blackpool to the city ground for a fixture Forest hadn't lost since 1964, well before these fans were born. But Forest met a Blackpool team full of confidence after their midweek win over Newcastle. Charlie Adam, in particular, has impressed since signing from Rangers during the summer. He took advantage of a wayward pass and still had a lot to do, but didn't he do it emphatically? His fourth goal in five matches. Forrest had drawn three of their last four championship games and responded quickly to try and get back into this one, but they simply couldn't find a way past the determined Blackpool defence. Many inside the city ground thought they'd witnessed an equaliser after the break, but Rob Earnshaw was ruled offside. And Ian Holloway's Blackpool rode their luck to take all three points. Well, I feel like a burglar, really. You know, um, I feel we, we came here and stole something that they probably played better than us, a better performance, but it's all about putting the ball in the net. And today you saw the, the unfair side of football, really, on, on the, the overall performance. They probably deserve to win, and um, we've ended up nicking it. Derby arrived at Selhurst Park, hoping to avoid a fourth successive defeat. New loan signing from Everton, James Vaughan, made the trip and started for the Rams. And it was the away team who first threatened. Gary Teal's free kick, forcing a fine save from Palace keeper Julian Speroni. Palace's last home win came against Derby, exactly five months ago. And they went ahead after the break in this one. Sean Derry with the headed pass, Darren Ambrose with the finish. His first goal for the Eagles at Selhurst Park. Palace gave a first championship start of the season to Johan Zertl. And the Austrian defender wasn't far away from scoring his first goal in English football. Derby had their chances to equalise, the best of which fell to Thiel. But once again he was denied by Speroni. Palace winning for the first time at home this season. Well, Robbie, won't need reminding. Uh, Derby, one win now in eight in all competitions. Uh, one nil, a fair result at Selhurst Park today? Not really. Um, we went there with a the game plan. We executed really well, but we lost the game one nil. We, the, their keeper was their man of the match. Yeah. There's some several good chances. And, but, you know, Palace are, are good at what they do. You know, they boom the ball along in midfield. You, you're absent in the game. You don't really get a touch. It's just winning second balls. And, and they're good at what they do. Yeah, <laughs> the second time your pent-up's gone. <laughs> uh, what about Spironi then and this uh, handball incident? Because uh, you had to have a chat to the referee. We're not quite sure why this wasn't a red card. Well, it's a difficult one. You know, the ball's out. Um, I think it's um, James Vaughan chasing the ball. And he's blatantly picked the ball up. So I've gone to the referee and asked the referee, you know, what's the situation? He said, well, because it's not a clear goal-scoring opportunity, that's why it's not a red card. He said mm. it's on the corner of the box. But I've said to him, well, if, if James Vaughan nicks the ball, it's an open goal. 
So, Steve, what do you think? That, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think yet again we have certain um, anomalies, certain decisions yeah. that are just about interpretation rather than you know, firmly set down. And yet again, it's, it's one referee would have sent him off, one would have booked him, one would have played, played on it. it we, we, I don't think they're quite sure, yeah. you know, regardless of so we're the way a derby, we think about it. Where are Derby at, Robbie? While you're here, let's get your views on that. Well, I think the manager's an absolute wonders off the field. You know, the, the previous two regimes have left the club, you know, you know in, a, in a bit of a mess, really. You know, he's had to clear 17 players out. Mm. You know, it's in a, he's in a difficult situation, but you know we're, we're so close from, that, from being a, a good team. Um, you know, he's, he's doing wonders, and we all love playing for him. You know, he's got a great spirit. But you know, it's Derby's wage bill last year was one of the highest in the league, and the manager had to off the field. He's an absolute wonders, and we owe it to him to get the results. Yeah, okay. Uh, we should say well done to both uh, Peterborough and Blackpool for two terrific results for them. Uh, let's go to Lizzie now for emails and texts. Lizzie. Yeah, Manish. Well, there have been lots of pretty disparaging texts from Plymouth fans, but I'm going to start with a nice one. Ron says, yes, it was a long journey and yes, we did lose, but he wants me to acknowledge how great the Newcastle fans were and how nice it was to go to St. James's Park. So there we go. Lots of very relieved posh fans there after they win against Reading, including Alan, who says, finally posh, win a game. Hopefully it'll lead to many others. But lots of Reading fans want to know just what happened in the dressing rooms at half time. Paul says, how on earth can a team leading 2-0 become so bad in the second half. What did Brendan Rodgers say? And Lawrence, who's also a Reading fan, says, Darren Ferguson's team talk must be like his dad's. Uh, we've had lots of Ipswich fans getting in touch, as you might expect, but it seems that most of them are growing to love Roy Keane, despite still being without a win in the league. Mitch says, I was very impressed with the fighting spirit to twice come from behind. It looks like the new players are starting to bed in, which is what everyone's been saying they will do eventually. And my belief in Keno has been reignited. And uh, on Blackpool's win over Forest, Ian says the Seasiders are proving the pundits wrong, but he also wants Ollie to bring in a couple of proven goal scorers. Who would you choose, Robbie and Steve? Proven goal scorers. I'm not saying a word. The last time you asked I know, this, I know. You came I up said, with Rob and he actually from Derby. slated me for saying it, <laughs> yeah. so I am not going anywhere in that respect. Robbie, proven goal scorer for Blackpool. I can't Anybody in the academy? Any, good... any other team's players, like Stevie did with us. Okay, <laughs> you're both playing it diplomatically. All right, we'll finish off the championship then with a look at last night's Sheffield derby as United welcomed Wednesday to Bramall Lane. The Owls were the last side to win at United earlier in the year. So, would they repeat the feat or did United get revenge? Tony Gubber has got the answers. Here's Montgomery, dispossessed. Gets in a good ball, looping over the top and touched over by Lee Grant. Tracy will take it. Headed down, hit a defender, hit in! Jamie Ward! It was Morgan who won the initial header. And he squeezed it in between the keeper and the post. Kyle Walker with the throw. Not cleared. Deflected in. It's a second. It's Darius Henderson. Driven in by Chet Evans. Henderson just stuck out a foot and he's deflected it into the net past Lee Grant. Gray lifts it in left footed. Tut guy. What a good save. Cottrell came off the defender oh it's in oh it's an own goal was it a push certainly there was an arm across the back of Buxton as he headed that oh hang on there's an early chance here and it was Isaias who's just on as a substitute. Oh, and they pull one back straight away. He hits it as it drops to Gay, and he's driven it into the bottom corner. It is Isaias. Took a swerve. Oh, and it's loose. Ah. 
Well, Tsudgai with a chance to get a second. It might need something really special to beat Mark Bunn from this distance. It is Asias. Oh, and it's in! What a strike by the substitute who came on at half time. It flew in. Oh, wonderful save. Fabulous save by Lee Grant. Here's Asias. Took it early. Oof. Just curling away from that top corner. What's nicely struck. Chet Evans from long range forces another fine save from Lee Grant. You know, I think uh, you can speak a lot about character and, you know, when, when you've got beat, you know, that's what you look at. You look at, right, can we bounce back? And to be honest, um, you know, over the last few months, you know, last season, the start of this season, when we do get a, a setback, we respond well, you know, and I think uh, that's all credit to the players. So bragging rights to United. Both Charlton and Leeds dropped their first points of the season last week and this is how they responded. Four years ago, these sides met in the Premier League. They've drifted down the divisions together, but Norwich and Charlton have had very different starts to the campaign. League-leading Charlton scored first. Dion Burton bagged a hat-trick against Norwich last season. He was at it again after just 18 minutes. Norwich are still finding their feet under manager Paul Lambert. Perhaps that explains why the Canaries seem disjointed at times. John Joe Shelby taking full advantage five minutes before the break to double the advantage. But as Charlton boss Phil Parkinson might have been putting the final touches to an easy half-time team talk, Norwich were back in it. Grant Holt catching out the Charlton back line with a quick throw. Wes Houlihan celebrating his return to the first team with a goal. And deep into stoppage time, Norwich got the equaliser. Holt with a brave header for his sixth of the season. That's two draws in a row now for Charlton. More than 24,000 inside Carrow Road for this one. Canaries manager Lambert quick to praise their contribution. So it's phenomenal support, absolutely phenomenal support. There's a bit of what it's what it's been getting over the last four or five years. But if we can if we can just get given a little bit of time, a little bit of help to get new players in, then um, to help the good ones that are here, then we'll, we'll be we'll be okay. This place is difficult, and uh, I've never known a group of supporters so delighted the home supporters to get a draw. And uh, you know, Norwich are a good team, but they should be a good team. They've got big resources. They've, they've brought about 10 players in the summer, and this was always going to be a difficult game today. And uh, you know, we acquitted ourselves well. Charlton's draw meant Leeds would go top with a win, and in front of their own fans, they never disappoint. United's last league defeat at Ellen Road was back in January, so Andy Barcham's impertinence, going close for Gillingham, only made them even more dangerous. 14 minutes was all it took the home side to establish the accepted order of things, as Robert Snodgrass picked out Bradley Johnson. A tremendous header from a player who's building quite a reputation for his goals from midfield. Before half an hour was up, Johnson exchanged passes with Jermaine Beckford and was on his way to number two. A muscular run, a nasty surprise for Simon Royce at his near post. Any prospect of a Gillingham comeback was extinguished inside the first minute of the second half. Beckford caught the eye again in the build-up, his flick releasing Johnny Howson, who finished with immense confidence. About time you'd have thought for Beckford to grab one himself. Joined by Johnson as the club's top scorer on five goals, he was only inches from going clear again in the scoring stakes. It says something for Leeds' strength that Gillingham were in so much trouble. The Kent club have been in good form themselves. Three league games unbeaten without conceding. Barcham showed they still believed. But Leeds made it to the final ten minutes without suffering any more damage. And Beckford nabbed that sixth of the season when Mickey Doyle's shot came back off the bar. The leader's home record is frightening. 15 successive league wins.
we started really brightly and more of the game off, but um, unfortunately we conceded, which rocked us a little bit to be fair, they, they got back into the game and um, had a bit of possession, but um, obviously the fourth one uh, killed the game off and they're very comfortable in the end, but uh, delighted for the win and, and to get the goals as well. A new contract and a new title for Paul Trollope at Bristol Rovers, previously first team coach, now officially manager after the Pirates' impressive start to the season. And the division's surprise packages were soon into their stride at Brentford. Trollope had worked hard to grab Chris Dixon on loan from Charlton this week, and it's not hard to see why. This would be a debut to remember. Dixon hasn't played much first team football lately, but it's going to take a lot to keep him out of the Rovers lineup after a display like this. A confident lob doubling the lead on 26 minutes. Five minutes before half time, Rovers made it three. Dixon with the layoff this time. Aaron Lescott with the finish. Rampant Rovers leaving Brentford's unbeaten home record in tatters. The Bees managed a consolation in the second half. Nothing wrong with Charlie McDonald's finish, but Brentford haven't won in six now, and Rovers, with three league victories in a row, continue to catch the eye. MK Dons deserved to win by more than a solitary goal at Wickham, but at least the one they did score was something special. Matthias Dumbe carrying the ball half the length of the pitch for his big moments. The Frenchman's first goal for the club took the Dons up to fourth in the standings. It was Tashback Day at the New Den as Millwall put their weight behind a male cancer awareness campaign. But on the pitch, the Lions were looking to end a run of six matches without a win. Chris Hackett showed the speed that made him a youth county sprint champion to open the scoring after 13 minutes. And in double-quick time, the Londoners had another in the back of the Huddersfield net. Neil Harris doesn't beat too many for pace, he just knows the way to goal. That was his sixth of the season. Five minutes after the break, it was all over. Steve Morrison, prolific in non-league football, with his first goal in Millwall colours. This wasn't Huddersfield at their best, a fact not disguised by Jordan Rhodes' eighth of the season, which led to a bizarre booking for Millwall keeper David Ford. With their long injury list shortening, the Lions could be getting ready to show their teeth. Walsall have been solid this season, but have struggled for wins at home, none at the Banks' stadium so far. Sean Morrison's mistakes seem to have given them the perfect platform this time. Troy Deeney's third of the season had the Saddlers ahead after just seven minutes. Swindon should have been level just after the break. No matter how many times you see it, Billy Painter's miss remains a mystery. But he soon had the chance to make amends. Pulled back by Darrell Westlake, the striker got up to take the spot kick himself. At least he was getting closer. Give Painter full marks for persistence. Ten minutes from time, Mark Hughes' handball presented Swindon with another penalty. Billy went the same way, but played just a little bit safer. His fourth of the season and a point finally in the bag. After a slow start to the season, Brighton are starting to gain a bit of momentum. They were unbeaten in three going into their home game against South End, but the Shrimpers had ended Leeds' 100% record last week, and they certainly started this one in confident mood, taking the lead after just eight minutes, Lee Barnard with the looping header, his eighth of the season. If South End have Barnard, then Brighton have their very own goal machine. Nicky Forster seems to get better with age, and the 36-year-old was on hand for his sixth strike in the last five matches. On Wednesday, South End managed to bring in Roy O'Donovan on loan from Sunderland. He was put straight into the starting lineup and rewarded Steve Tilson's faith with a debut goal, a close range tap in to put South End 2 1 up. But that lead didn't last long. Five minutes before the break, Brighton were level again, and inevitably it was the prolific Forster, a magnificent seventh of the season, although keeper Steve Mildenhall might not want to see this one too many more times. Into the second half, and a rampaging Forster is in search of a hat-trick. This time, though, Mildenhall is able to make amends with a sharp save to preserve parity. Lady Luck wasn't smiling on the Albion. First, Elliot Bennett hit the crossbar, and in the ensuing scramble, it seemed like half the Brighton team were offside. So Forster's finish was quite rightly ruled out. 
but the game was to have a dramatic stoppage time twist. Francis Laurent was the man to step down to make way for O'Donovan's inclusion, but having come on as substitute, he soon made his mark, torturing Tommy Elphick on the way to scoring from a sharp angle. It gave Southend their first win on the road this season, much to the annoyance of Brighton manager Russell Slade. Very, very disappointing to take. Sickner, really. Um, thought we dominated long periods of the second half, to be honest. Um, and then Tommy Elphick really has given him a birthday present in the 90th minute, to be honest. Two very busy men at the community stadium, referee Andy Warmer and Colchester's Kevin Lisby, who after Clive Platt was fouled, wasted the chance to put the home side ahead. He didn't need to hide his face for long. The embarrassment lasted only five minutes. Just before half-time, Hartlepool's Gary Little hauled down Coyote Oda J. Mr Warmer was watching closely and Lisby pluckily decided to try again. Keeper Scott Flinders beaten by the pace of the penalty. And amazingly, the pair were face-to-face -face again straight after the break. The same offender, Liddell's handball, and the same result. Lisby ensured Hartlepool's unbeaten away record would come to an end and gave new boss Aidy Boothroyd his first win. Stockport County have been hit and miss at home this season, but late Orient are in trouble. They haven't won in eight now and never looked likely to after Nicholas Bignall opened the scoring on 49 minutes. The Reading low knee taking advantage of a slip from Charlie Daniels and slotting home. Stockport's second, 13 minutes from time, sealed it. Greg Tansy's name isn't on the score sheet too often, but this one was a beauty. The Londoners grabbed a late lifeline when defender Tamika Umkandawiri cleaned up a mess in the penalty area, but it wasn't enough, and this result sees the O's drop into the bottom four. Once their fans finished teasing the mascot, Oldham's players set about doing the same to Carlisle's defence. A terrific flowing move earned the Latics the lead after 13 minutes. Pavel Abbott applied the finishing touch. Nobody could afford to get carried away. Oldham have struggled on their own turf this year. At the other end, Scott Doby was going to give them all sorts of problems and went mighty close to a Carlisle equaliser. But Oldham's long-awaited Boundary Park win was secured seven minutes into the second half. Keegan Parker bundled home his first goal since joining from Huddersfield. The Latics had struggled along since Valentine's Day without a single home success. So love was all around. A league win at last for long-suffering Southampton, although they needed a pair of penalties either side of the break to make sure of the spoils against Yeovil. First, Marek Saganowski chopped down by Terrell Forbes, and Ricky Lambert beating the dive of keeper Richard Martin to set Saints on their way. The second, a handball against Nathan Jones, looked harsh on the Yeovil defender, but don't expect any South Coast sympathy. Lambert won his personal duel with Martin again, and although Saints are still on minus points, they're also unbeaten in five. John Barnes did his best to rally the troops, but Tranmere's dismal run continued in Devon. 17-year-old keeper Joe Collister beaten by Adam Stansfield after 25 minutes. The teenager's presence between the posts seeming to back the manager's claim that Rovers have very little cash to play with. Even so, pressure's mounting on the boss. His side's sixth straight league defeat sealed by Stansfield after the break. The 16th time Tranmere have conceded during that run. Exeter's second win of the campaign was marred only by a consolation goal from Michael Ricketts, the first Rovers have scored on the road. But Barnes remains upbeat. Of course your confidence is dented a little bit, it has to because you know, you're losing matches. You're losing matches, but understanding why you're losing matches and, and seeing what you've done in the past and seeing what, um, how well the team has played in terms of, because I'm not asking them to do any different now than I asked them to do against Chillingham, who were a decent side, or against MK Downs, who were one of the top teams and we did okay in those matches. So, you know, we're not doing anything different now or in terms of what I'm asking them to do, in terms of training or anything like that. Um, so, you know, as far as what I want them to do, I still have belief in that, yeah. Thank you. So John Barnes insisting he can still turn things around. Um, so what about Leeds, Robbie? Obviously, they've taken the league by storm. Uh, seven wins out of eight now for them. Can anyone stop them? When they've got the front two fit and Beckford and Becchio, I don't think they can. Also, Johnson chipping in with a few goals. Played with him at Brighton last year, fantastic player. 
he's coming in with goals now too, but when they've got Be Becky on Beckcliffe, there's no stopping them. What about Bristol Rovers, Steve? Mm. Six wins out of seven under Paul Troller. Yeah. Uh, good times at the Memorial Ground. He Fantastic. signed on for an extra 12 yeah. months. Joker 4 signed on for an extra 12 months. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're doing brilliantly. Well, when you consider they sold a player in Richie Lambert, who was, you know, yeah. I think he had something like 27 goals last year for them. I mean, it's an amazing achievement. And, and you get the feeling that it's just brought the club even closer together. And they, they were obviously confident that they could handle his departure, and clearly they were right. Southampton got their first win today, Robbie. Uh, obviously, they started the season on minus 10, but after four draws, they've got a victory. Psychologically, how, how much of a boost is that for the players? A huge boost. Um, you know, seeing the manager's comments there saying that Norwich. You know, massive club. You know, they've got the um, necessary things to get back up. But Southampton, have. they're a massive club too. So this win will set them on a run, and hopefully, you know, they can do have a, have a good season from here on in. Okay, time now to hear from League One fans on the emails and texts. Lizzie, what have you got for us? Well, Manisha, I've got lots and lots of very happy Leeds fans, but I've also got many, many unhappy Tranmere fans. And they are all, I'm afraid, calling for John Barnes to go after their defeat to Exeter. And like last week, lots of you asking for Ronnie Moore to return to Prenton Park. Martin says, uh, please, John, walk away now before our survival task gets too great. You're just not cut out to be a football manager. Now, last week you were calling Barnes and McAteer dumb and dumber. This week, someone's calling them digger and trigger. If you think you can do better, then let me know. And while we're talking about Exeter, Tranmere, um, an anonymous text here says, don't moan about the miles, Plymouth. You look like you'll be playing at the other St. James's Park next season, which is only 45 miles up the road. So you've been warned, Plymouth. Johnny, who's a Stockport fan, says, I'm getting a bit worried that Liverpool will want Gary Ablett, who's, of course, ex-Liverpool, to replace Benitez. Uh, and I promised Bill Turnbull I'd put a Wickham Wanderers text in. Dave has texted in to say, uh, here's a message for Peter Taylor. Stop playing 4-5-1. It just doesn't work. We were awful in the first half today. And yet again... When we changed to 4-4-2 in the second half, we looked at half-decent science. So there you go, Peter Taylor. And finally, a quick question for Steve and Robbie from Mark, who is a Sheffield United fan. He says, me and my dad think that the offside trap is ruining the game. Discuss. Steve. No, I mean, it's always been part and parcel. You can't take it out. I suppose if it works, it's, it's effective. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you've got to have four players that know how to do it. Absolutely. And, and quite often, if it doesn't work, then it results in an opportunity for the, for the opposition. So... It's not Robbie's concern, and he's staying quiet. Now, top played bottom in League Two as the Football League's basement club, Darlington, welcomed Bournemouth. Colin Todd continues to desperately shuffle his Darlington pack. Three debutants for the visit of Bournemouth, but it would be the same old story for the struggling hosts. Brett Pittman recently signed a contract extension on the South Coast, and it's not hard to see why the Cherries are keen to keep him. Darlington did have their chances. One of the new boys, Jamie DeVitt, on loan from Hull City, stung the palms of Bournemouth keeper Schwan Jalal. Darlington's hastily assembled squad seem to be still getting to know each other, and confidence is low. Even old warhorse Dean Windass is struggling. This freeze in front of goal summing up his season. Bournemouth weren't at their best, but nothing seems to be going Darlington's way these days. DeVitt again denied by Jalal. And they were cruelly punished on the counter-attack with seven minutes left. Tony Kane, another debutant, handled in the box as Anton Robinson looked set to score. Pittman took the penalty and duly notched up his fifth in the last three games. Poor old Darlington already adrift at the bottom. The Cherries remain at the top of the League Two tree. Right, here's the rest of the action in League Two, starting with Burton Albion enjoying their first ever campaign in the Football League against second place Dagenham and Redbridge. After being pipped to a playoff place on the last day of last season, Dagenham and Redbridge seemed desperate to take the automatic route, and Paul Benson got them off to a flying start at Burton. The home side had a guilt edge chance to draw level when Robin Schrute set up Andy Corbett. You'll never see a more astonishing miss. Sympathy seemed to be in short supply. And the malaise was catching. In first half stoppage time, Sean Harrod took a tumble. But when he took the penalty, power rather than placement was the wrong decision. Tony Roberts saved crucial as Dagenham and Redbridge held out for all three points, while Corbett's woeful afternoon was topped off by the terrible back pass which sold Guy Branston short and earned the defender a straight red for bringing down the goalbound Benson. Dagenham keep pace with the leaders.
Rotherham might be without a manager, but they do have a prolific goal scorer. And once Cheltenham keeper Scott Brown had an attack of the dropsies, Adam Lafondre nipped in for his sixth of the season, although perhaps his first added by all style slide. The Millers haven't won since manager Mark Robbins was poached by Barnsley. Only a post thwarted Danny Harrison here. When Cheltenham boss Martin Allen brought Julian Allsop back to Wadden Road, he described him as a grisly old fatty lump of lard. But this equaliser with five minutes left leaves Allsop just two goals away from becoming the club's all-time leading league scorer. But also, and the Robins are well-deserved point. Barnett hadn't lost in six league games and Bradford had gone four unbeaten, so this always looked likely to be tight. It was the Yorkshire club that edged ahead, James Hansen rewarding the Bantams for a bright first-half performance. But Barnett improved after the break, and John O'Flynn, who netted 18 times last season, showed he's still got the knack. Goals are a lot less common for Bradford's Zesh Raymond. He last hit the target in October 2003, which might be why nobody bothered to mark him from James O'Brien's corner. Barnett piled forward in search of a second equaliser, and Raymond made himself a hero at the other end too. Jake Hyde's effort goal-bound, the defender equally agile. But the London club's pressure finally told with 19 minutes to go. Bradford were backpedalling desperately, and O'Flynn's cross set up Mark Hughes for his first goal since signing from Chester back in January. Both unbeaten runs stretched by one more game. The moment Notts County fans were waiting for, the much-anticipated debut of Sol Campbell. According to some reports, Campbell's 40 grand a week would cover Morecambe's entire running costs for a month. Value for money? Well, the ex-England man was definitely left standing as Phil Jevons had a header come back off the post after 17 minutes. And Sol was nowhere to be seen as the Shrimps broke the deadlock on 36 minutes. Veteran skipper Jim Bentley with the finish. Morecambe's second also came from a header. Paul Mullin at the near post seven minutes into the second half. The Shrimps on their way to a first win of the season. But then nerves began to kick in and the visitors began to exert tremendous pressure. 20 minutes remained when Ben Davis pulled one back to set up a grandstand finish. But the home goal led a charmed life. Craig Westcar hit a post with the keeper stranded. Sven in the stands probably reflecting on an old football truth, money can't buy your luck. And at the death, not even acrobatics from keeper Kasper Schmeichel could rescue a point. This, amazingly, was Morecambe's day. Campbell and County will be back. For much of the first half at Gresty Road, it looked like there could be only one result. Crew very much on top, and in front after 16 minutes through Sean Miller. But the Alex failed to make their dominance count, and the good work was undone just past the half hour when Scott Donnelly took aim. His fifth of a season helped home by a big deflection. After half-time, Crewe seemed to lose their momentum, and the shots clinched the points brilliantly. Kirk Hudson making the most of the space with a tremendous turn, and finished a match. Two successive away victories for Aldershot, who move up to fifth, though it took the timely intervention of Chris Blackburn to protect their three points. Miller denied his second of the match. Northampton continued to be in free fall following the sacking of Stuart Gray. A Rochdale side who hadn't won away in nine took full advantage. Will Buckley's cross giving Oldham Loney Chris O'Grady a first goal for his new side. After the break, there was some hope for the Cobblers as they cobbled together an equaliser out of nothing. Adebayo Akinfen were teeing up Ryan Gilligan, who somehow found a gap through a forest of legs. Chris Dagnall had scored five in five matches for Dale. Who better to take full advantage of a chance provided by Simon Brown's parry? But even informed strikers will miss a sitter now and then. But like any good striker, Dagnall made amends, laying the ball off for Will Buckley to smash home an unstoppable winner. Dale's first away win of the season moves them up to fifth. Northampton's slide continues. Shrewsbury move into the playoff places as Lincoln's slump continued with their fifth defeat in six games. Jake Simpson brought the best out of Rob Birch as the Shrews made the early running. 
and they got their breakthrough just before the half hour. Jake Robinson was inches from a crucial connection the first time, but picked himself up for a much simpler finish, his third of the season. Lincoln put up a fight, but were possibly lucky not to lose Scott Kerr for a nasty-looking tackle on Simpson, which not surprisingly outraged their opponents. The Imps captain escaped with his fourth yellow card of the campaign. If that seemed lenient, no such luck for Moses Swabu 14 minutes from the end when he was caught out by a tricky bounce. Shrewsbury's handball appeals accepted, and Dave Hibbert had the chance to score for the fourth game running. His seventh goal of the season made the win safe. You wouldn't know Chesterfield hadn't won in a month the way they started against a Macclesfield side, still apparently with much to learn about the offside trap. Wade Small taking full advantage on four minutes. Last season's top scorer, Jack Lester, has had a frustrating time of it this campaign. 22 efforts on goal, he's only scored once. But he was in the right spot to double both his and Chesterfield's tally after 32 minutes. Five minutes later, it was three, as Macclesfield's defensive frailties were exposed by Gregor Robertson's cross and Jamie Lowry's sixth goal in seven games. The home side's fourth came on the stroke of half-time. Small's teasing run, turning Macclesfield defenders inside out, and the layoff giving Manchester City loney Donald McDermott a chance he took in style. A goal in successive weekends for the Irish teenager. The home side had done enough, although Small seemed hungry for more. The crossbar had other ideas. Hamza Ben Sharif's second of the season with 11 minutes left meant Macclesfield had the last word, but this defeat drops them four places and into the bottom two. Not much to celebrate. Formed in 1876, Port Vale are the only football league club not named after a specific geographical location. They're in the potteries, in case you've never been. Twice in their history, they've been forced out of the league, resigning in 1907 due to financial difficulties, and expelled in 1968 when Stanley Matthews was their manager due to financial irregularities. They reached the FA Cup semi-finals in 1954, and in 1997, under manager John Rudge, they narrowly missed out on the playoffs for the Premier League. When Rudge was surprisingly sacked two years later, supporters released 843 helium balloons to commemorate each of his games in charge. That's a lot of games and a lot of balloons. Darts legend Phil Taylor is a fan. Singer Simon Webb from Blue was with the club's centre of excellence until a torn ligament ended his football career. In 2005, major shareholder Robbie Williams formed Los Angeles Vale FC based at his LA home. He must have a really big back garden. If Vale had played this game in Robbie's back garden, he'd have closed the curtains, the Valiants slipping to their first home defeat. Ryan Lowe's shot crept over the line when his toe poked wrong-footed Chris Martin, which was just the break Berry needed after five games without scoring. Mike Jones had the original shot, which Lowe diverted, and destiny was clearly against the midfielder getting any share of the glory, the post intervening the next time he tried his luck. Vale manager Mickey Adams admitted his team didn't cause the Berry keeper anywhere near enough problems. Even having an extra man for the last couple of minutes made no difference. A second booking for Ryan Cresswell, the only sour moment of the Shakers' afternoon as they collected their third win on the road, a stark contrast to their dismal form at Gig Lane. Hereford brought in three new faces this week in a bid to end a miserable run of 16 league games without a win, and one of them made his mark early. Lester Loney, Craig King, pouncing on Ian Dunbavin's clangor after only six minutes. King was one of four debutants on display for the home side who had a chance to double their lead after Mark Pugh was scythed down in the box by Bobby Grant. But Pugh was left with a face redder than an Accrington shirt after his cheeky penalty attempt went oh so wrong. Dunbavin probably couldn't believe his luck. But Pugh's blushes were spared when Ryan Valentine headed in Mark Marshall's corner. Hereford's first league win since March. The long wait finally over. Torquay's promising first few games are a fast-fading memory as the league newcomers slip to their fifth straight league defeat. Nothing's going their way at the moment, as defender Kevin Nicholson would testify. 
Michael Pope left stranded by his teammates attempted clearance and the keeper's forgettable match was topped off by a second that sneaked around the outside of the wall. Peter Sweeney finding the swerve to rubber stamp a win that lifts Grimsby away from danger. Well, very briefly, your results of the game in, in League Two, or results of the day, I think, it, I think it has to be Sammy McElroy's Morecambe beating Notts County. Yeah, I think, yeah, and Robbie? I'm going for Berry's win at Port Vale. Mick Heldon's side and beating four. Berry hadn't won in four, so I go yeah. for Berry. Berry hadn't scored for seven and a half hours, incidentally, uh, before today. Uh, let's look at Casper Schmeichel's uh, attempt to get Notts County back on level terms. This was awfully close, wasn't it? This is a fantastic bit of skill. I mean, I for a keeper to show this sort of technique and uh, look where he takes that, the height of that ball. I mean, it's right over as well. Brilliant bit of skill. We saw Adam Federici, of course, from Reading doing something similar against Cardiff. Uh, what about um, Andy Corbett then from, from Burton? So we've seen one narrow miss from a goalkeeper. We've got an outfield player here who um, he unfortunately missed a, yeah. a sitter. I mean, this is almost, this is incredible. Isn't it? How you can manage to keep this out from there. I mean, you look at it saying, is there too much pace on the board? Does it take a little bit of deflection? Is it, is it a bobble? 